Welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to host today's webinar for quantitative plant biology, which is a journal I'm very excited about. The journal aims to promote quantification, reproducibility, data and code sharing in plant science. We have an outstanding group of academic editors who I'm sure would be delighted to handle your manuscripts. So please do, do consider submitting your best research to us. Talking about outstanding academic editors, Today's webinar will be given by one of the team, Professor Boon Leong Lim. Boon is a world leader in the area of quantitative approaches for understanding the relationship between energy and plant growth. His research focuses on carbon metabolism, photosynthesis, and organ organelle biology, to all of which he's made seminal contributions. Boon recently published an excellent paper with quantitative plant biology, and it's this work he's gonna tell us about today. So thank you, Boone, for agreeing to give this seminar, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Richard. And let me share my screen. Um, well, um, today I'm going to talk about my work on two organelles. Um, in the high school textbook, um, it says that um, the chloroplast harvests light energy and then uh, breaks CO2 and then produce sugars, which can be used by the mitochondrion to generate ATP. And chloroplasts and mitochondrion, actually they are endosine biotins, and then uh, they both carry their own genomes, and both of them have the electron transport chains. And then in the chains, electrons flow through the chains and generate proton gradient, and then uh, each of them have an ATPase that can generate ATP. And then because their genomes only express uh, a uh, couple of genes, many genes that are translated in the nucleus, oh, sorry, uh, they are um, encoded in the nucleus and translated in the cytosol have to be input into the chloroplast and mitochondrion through the uh, TOC complex on the outer membrane of the chloroplast and the TOM complex of the outer membrane of the mitochondrion respectively. So um, in the chloroplast, uh, there are two photosystems, photosystem one and photosystem two. And the photosystem two collect the electrons from waters, and then the water will pass through a linear electron flow, and at the end, it, they will reduce the NADP to generate NADPH. And in the linear electron flow, it also generates a proton gradient that can drive the production of ATP by the ATP synthase. And it has been calculated that in the linear electron flow, um, it can generate ATP and NADPH at a ratio of 1.286. And then there is also a cyclic electron flow, okay? And the cyclic electron flow does not involve photosystem two, but it can just go around and around and then can generate the proton gradient such that uh, it can drive ATP synthesis. So the cyclic electron flow just supply extra ATP. So we all know that to fix one carbon uh, molecules, to fix one CO2, uh, it will consume three ATP molecules and two NADPH molecules. So the demand of ATP to NADPH by carbon fixation uh, would be 1.5. However, the supply of ATP to NADPH by the linear electron flow would be at a ratio of 1.286. So it seems that there is not enough ATP. So if ATP is insufficient, that will cause the accumulation of NADPH and that will be insufficient NADP. And so it will slow down the LEF. So it is important to balance the demand and the supply of the ATP and NADPH. Otherwise there will be traffic jam. So the question is, how does plant chloroplast obtain additional ATP? Psychic electron flow certainly, but how about ATP import from cytosol? So uh, in this 2015 Nature paper that studied diatoms, uh, it showed that the, in the chloroplast, the extra NADP can be exported through the Marley OAA shuttle in the form of Marley and reach the mitochondrion that will release NADH. And the NADH can be consumed by the mitochondrion electron transport chain to generate ATP that ATP will be exported into the cytosol 
and then which will be input into the chloroplast so that the ATP can supply the Kelvin cycle. So in dye terms, cytosolic ATP can enter chloroplast to supply extra ATP for the Kelvin cycle. But how about in plants? So here, the Mali OA chateau is like this, okay? This is a chromidomonas, okay? So you can see that in the chloroplast, the extra NADPH can convert the OAA into Mali, okay? And regenerate NADP. The Mali can be exported to the cytosol and then import into mitochondrion, and the Mali can be converted back into OAA and generate NADH. And the NADH can be consumed by the mitochondrial electron transport chain to generate ATP. So this is the Malik OAA shuttle. So how about in France? Um, about 50 years ago, um, in 1969, Professor Held uh, published a paper, adenine nucleoside nucleotide translocation in Spanish coloplast. And then his conclusion is that ATP can move in and move out mature coloplast freely. So this paper has been cited for more than 200 times and at the daytime, uh, it is suggested to supply ATP to chloroplast. And at the nighttime, in this uh, review paper published in 2011, uh, it said chloroplast during the night rely on the input of energy in the form of ATP via the NTT. The NTT is the ATP transporter on the chloroplast membrane. So at night, um, it, it was suggested that. Uh, this could supply ATP from the cytosol to chloroplast to meet the energy demand in the dark. In our group, we uh, employ a uh, sensor, a magnesium ATP sensor, uh, AT1.03. This sensor was developed by Professor Imarula, and he tested this in animal system. And then uh, we adopt this and transform this into our redoxes. And this sensor, have two photochrome, which are linked by an epsilon subunit that can bind ATP. So when the ATP concentration increases, the distance between these two photochrome will be closer, and that will be the uh, energy transfer. And if energy transfer happens, and then the emission at 5 to 7 nanometer will increase, whereas the emission at 475 will decrease. So you can see that when there are more ATP, um, 527, oh, sorry, 527 increase, but 475 uh, decrease. So if we look at the ratio of these two uh, emissions, then uh, we can plot a graph, and then uh, this is the ATP concentration. So uh, by looking at the ratio, we can uh, um, <laughs> look at the change in the concentration of the magnesium ATP. And the advantage of using this sensor is that it is independent of the protein expression level. So uh, no, no matter if it's expressed in different concentration in different cells or in different uh, organelles, then you don't need to worry about the uh, protein abundance. We also introduce a pH sensor. This pH sensor is also a uh, ratio metric and that uh, it can be excited by two wavelengths and then the emission is 5 to 0. So we can look at the emission uh, excited by these two wavelengths and then get the ratio. And then we can, uh, when the pH change, this ratio will change. The advantage of using ratio metric fluorescence protein sensor is that it does not require plant extraction. And then we can look at the changes in individual cells, in sub-organ, uh, subcellular organelles, we can, uh, look at the implanter chain. Whereas for some other in vitro method like bioluminescence, HPLC, mass spec, they all require plant extraction and then uh, you, 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 you cannot look at individual cells or subcellular organelles. So we introduced the ATP sensors into the stomach and cytosol, and we failed to introduce it into mitochondrion, maybe uh, because mitochondrion uh, was too small. And then, but we, can introduce the pH sensors into the stoma and mitochondrial matrix. And then we generate transgenic plant and then manipulate by illumination and various inhibitors. First, we compare the ATP concentration in plastic and cytosol. And this is a 10 base O settings. And then um, 
we look at cotyledon, hypococtyl, and root. We can see that um, the plastid in this free tissue, they have much lower ATP concentration than in the cytosol. The red means high ATP concentration, the blue means low concentration. So uh, we can see that in the cotyledon, the cytosol have a ATP concentration higher than the uh, maximum detection range of the sensor, which is 1.4 millimolar. Whereas in the hypococtyl, it falls within the range and in the root is lower. But in the past, it, um, the concentration were very low. So the question is, why stormal ATP concentration is lower than cytosolic ATP concentration? Is that because of inefficient importation of ATP or ATP consumption in Coropus is tremendous? So we look at the plants at different ages. Uh, this is three days old, four days old, and six day old uh, seedlings. And we can see that uh, in the uh, past it, in hypococtyl and cordyledon, uh, three days old, uh, comparable to the cytosoid, but uh, the pastitic concentration uh, start to decrease when the seedlings mature, whereas the cytosoid concentration remains stable. So now we know that in 2004, okay, a German group have identified two Coral Plus ATP transporter which are the AT-NTT1 and AT-NTT2 in the Coropus genome, and then they study it. And then it is shown that uh, AT-NTT2 is highly expressed in the cordyledon in the seeding, but when the seeding grew to six day old, uh, it stopped expression in the cordyledon, and it was only expressed in the root and in the young developing leaves. And then uh, now we know that the NTT transporter actually is an antiporter of ATP and NADPH. So our hypothesis is that our NTT transporter could be downregulated in mature chloroplasts and restrict the importation of ATP from cytosol. To prove it, this, to prove this, we isolate chloroplasts that contain the ATP sensor from four days old five days old, 10 days old, and 20 days old seedlings. And then we add exogenous ATP. And if the ATP can get into the chloroplast, the uh, sensor signal ratio will increase. So we can see that the ATP indeed could enter four day old chloroplast, five day old chloroplast, but could not enter 10 days old or 20 days old chloroplast. So why we had a uh, contradictory result uh, from this paper. So uh, we looked at this paper carefully, and this is what was done. First, uh, mature chloroplast was isolated from uh, mature spinach, bought from a market, and then uh, radioactive ATP was added to isolate the chloroplast, and uh, he assumed that ATP had been input into stroma. And then he washed the chloroplast to remove the uh, <coughs> radioactive ATP. And then he added uh, cold ATP to the chloroplast and then uh, assumed that the cold ATP could exchange the hot ATP inside the chloroplast. And then uh, th this was his result. He found that ATP could elude the radioactive ATP inside the chloroplast whereas CDP, UTP, GTP could not. He also tests ADP, but you could see that ADP actually uh, is less efficient than ADP in so-called exchange. However, now we know that actually the NTT transporter is an antiporter of ATP and ADP. So if the radioactive ATP has been uh, translocated in the stoma, ADP should be more effective than ATP in a chain. But this was not the case. So actually, the radioactive ATP did not enter the chloroplast, but just absorbed on the surface of the chloroplast, so that when uh, the cold ATP was added, it dissolved the radioactive ATP on the surface of the chloroplast. So based on his own data, 
actually it showed that there was no ATP translocation, but just absorption. So uh, we also looked at uh, the uh, illumination at the 10 day old uh, cordyledon. And we can see that um, this is the, uh, we turn on the light, this is the stormal ATP. Uh, when we turn on the light, it will increase, but when we turn off the light, it will drop within 30 seconds. And we turn on the light again, it increases again. When we, turn off, when we turn off the light, it decreases again. So this data show that chloroplast consumes large amount of ATP in the dark. And then we uh, collect protoplast from the cotyledon, and that carry the sensor in the cytosol. And then we transfer the uh, vector carrying the entity one, entity two, or the empty vector into the protoplast and the incubate overnight. Uh, we can see that uh, if the NTT1 and NTT2 were overexpressed, the ATP concentration in the cytosol actually decreased to a very low level. So this experiment shown that uh, if mature chloroplast still express high concentration of NTT transporter, it will consume a large amount of cytosolic ATP at night, and it is not energy efficient. We also uh, safely express the NDTs into Arbidopsis and we generate two overexpression lines uh, of <coughs> AT NDT1 and AT NDT2 overexpression line. And you can see that uh, the cordyledon are uh, uh, a little bit pale comparing to the line that express the vectors. And then if we grow these plants in long day, they look similar, they have similar diameter, but if we grow it, them in um, grow them in short day, then we can see that the line that stably express the entity transporter grew smaller. It was uh, because uh, the plant wastes some energy in the dark. So the major findings of using these ATP sensors include chloroplasts consume large amount of ATP in the dark, and unlike unicellular diatom. Cytosolic ATP does not enter mature chloroplast of Arbidopsis, and mature Arbidopsis chloroplast don't regulate NTT transporter to reduce energy expenditure in the duct. And then our hypothesis is that the diatoms, they are unicellular, they do not need to export sucrose, so they just need to take care of themselves. But for Arbidopsis, it's a multicellular, and the major function of mesophyll is to export sucrose. So the mesophyll chloroplasts uh, have to uh, harvest energy, okay, and then fix carbon in the day, and then it has to reduce its energy expenditure in the dark, and as a, and therefore they have to downregulate the NTT transporters. So the NTT transporter is only expressed in the uh, developing past it because the developing past it cannot. Uh, carry out photosynthesis, so ATP has to be import uh, to support chloroplast biogenesis. And for mature chloroplast, ATP cannot get into the chloroplast from the cytosoid. So in the dark, if the chloroplast require ATP, it has to rely on uh, the uh, glycolysis in the stroma. And then uh, we also uh, treat the um, uh, seedings with the uh, cytosolic ATP sensors with uh, different inhibitors of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. You can see that red means high ATP, and then if we use the rotenone that inhibit complex one or TTFA that inhibit complex two, the ATP concentration drop. And if we use both, it drops to a very low level. So this experiment show that mitochondrion is the major source of cytosolic ATP in the duct. And then if we lower the cytosolic ATP because it was too high, that exceeds the uh, detection limit. So we use rotenon to lower the cytosolic ATP to the detectable range. And then we turn on the light, we can see that within seconds, 30 seconds, the cytosolic ATP increased. And this is light dependent because it could be inhibited by DCMD. And then uh, if we inhibit uh, the ATP production from mitochondria using oligomycin. And when we turn on the light, we can still see some ATP 
uh, increase in the cytosol, and this could be due to glycolysis. So uh, here uh, we have uh, introduced the pH sensor into the uh, mitochondrion matrix. And you can see that uh, when we turn on the light, okay, this is 60 seconds, uh, that is alkalization of the mitochondrial matrix. And when the light is, was off, it dropped and turn on the light again and turn off the light again. So this experiment shown that illumination stimulates mitochondrion activity, uh, possibly by uh, the, because elimination uh, generate reducing equivalent. So what are the source of reducing equivalence to mitochondria for ATP production? And then uh, we know that in the dark, the TCA cycle is a cycle. So it generates NADH, and then uh, that fit into the mitochondrial electron transport chain. However, uh, under illumination, the TCA cycle is not a circle. So in the light, the TCA cycle will slow down, and this is not a cycle. So uh, if we look at uh, this ratio, okay, the demand of Kelvin cycle uh, of ADP to NAD batch is 1.5, whereas the uh, LEF only supplied 1.286. And uh, the conclusion is that there is insufficient ATP. However, if we reverse this, this becomes 0.666, this becomes 0.777, and that means that there is surplus NAD pH. So to balance the ratio, the plant chloroplasts need to export surplus reducing equipment. And the Mali OAA shuttle is uh, one of the way for the chloroplasts to export the surplus uh, reducing equipment. Uh, and this figure is in the uh, chromidomonas. So how about in plant? Does it work? So uh, in the C3 plants, in addition to the Mali OAA shuttle, uh, there is photorespiration. Is it because the oxygen uh, is fixed by the rubisco to generate one 3PJ and one 2PJ? And the 2PJ has to be recycled to 3PJ through a multiple enzymatic step that involves three organelles. And in this process, uh, in the mitochondrion, um, the glycine decarboxylate that convert glycine in the serine will generate NADH in the mitochondria. So in this 2019 paper, um, it, he proposed two models. Model one is that both glycine decarboxylase in mitochondria and the Mali OAA shadow could fit reducing equivalent to the mitochondria EDC to generate ADP. And then in another model uh, is that uh, the GTC uh, produce a lot of NADH, which exceeds the capacity of the mitochondrial electron transport chain so that the surplus NADH has to be exported via the Mali OAA shuttle to the cytosol. So in model one and model two, you can see that the direction of the Mali OAA shuttle are opposite. And both models uh, have been um, in, in the diagram, I found from this paper, some paper uh, in the diagram, this is import, and in this paper, this is export. So which one is correct? So uh, we adopt a NAD pitch sensor developed by uh, Professor Yang Yi of uh, ECUSD. And uh, this is also a ratio metric sensor that uh, depend on the binding of NADPH. And we test this in animal and we introduce it into, my, uh, sorry, into Aridopsis. And he also developed a sensor uh, that can measure the NADH to NAD ratio. Uh, we also introduce this into Aridopsis. And then uh, we introduce this sensor into cytosol, past it and peroxisome, and the transgenic plant just grew normally. And then for the NADPX sensors, there are uh, two affinity. There's a high affinity, there's a low affinity, and we introduce into uh, peroxisome, stoma, and cytosol. And then this is the change upon illumination. 
And then based on this, uh, we conclude that uh, the cytosol has a lower NAD pH level than chloroplast and pyroxism. And then uh, when we uh, eliminate the uh, 10 days old seeding, uh, we can see that uh, at the light intensity of 40 or 296, uh, they can stimulate the NAD pH level in the stomach upon elimination, and when the light was off, it will drop. And this is the stomach uh, NADH, NAD ratio, and elimination also increased the ratio, and when the light uh, was off, um, the ratio decreased. However, if we treat the seedings with AAN, which is an inhibitor of the glycine decarboxylate, uh, this is the folder inhibitor of NAD big, and but with the inhibitor, there is no increase. And then uh, for the NADH NAD ratio, without inhibitor, it increased. And then with the inhibitor, there is no increase. Whereas ATP still increased, and the mitochondrion still have a uh, alkalization of their matrix. So under the AAN treatment, uh, there was no increase in stomach NAD pH and NADH NAD ratio upon elimination, but stomach ATP still increased. We also treat the seedings with um, sodium hydrogen carbonate. And with the sodium hydrogen carbonate, because they are ample supply of CO2, so there was no photorespiration. And again, there was no increase in the stomal NAD pH upon elimination. This is uh, with the carbonate. This is the uh, NADH NAD ratio. So, so based on um, this data, we propose that uh, model two is correct. Is it because when GDC uh, is inhibited, okay, by AAN or by the uh, when there's no photorespiration, okay, there will be uh, more, okay, uh, reducing power could be consumed by the mitochondrial electron transport chain so that there's no increase in NAD pH in the chloroplast. So uh, other observations that support this conclusion include uh, C3 rubisco pick up uh, oxygen and CO2 at a 1.3 ratio. So the flux of photorespiration is quite large. And GDC is the most abundant soluble protein in C3 mitochondrion. So comprising approximately 40% of the mitochondrial matrix proteins. So there must be a high demand of this enzyme. And then the volume of stomach is about 40, 20 times of the volume of the mitochondria. So the, uh, so uh, it's very small, the mitochondria. And, uh, we can see that uh, during photosynthesis, Mali actually accumulate in the cells and uh, in the dark, it will decrease. So uh, this is uh, <laughs> our model. Okay, uh, during elimination, uh, there is surplus NAD pH because LEF generate more reducing power. And so this will be uh, export from the chloroplast through the Mali OA shuttle in the form of Mali. And then photorespiration also generate a lot of NADH in the mitochondrion, and uh, the surplus has to be export in the form of malate, and the malate will be uh, stored in the uh, ratio. So this is why the malate will uh, accumulate uh, during illumination. And then this is important because it can be generate the NADP so that the NADP can uh, carry uh, and can serve as the electron transporter of the linear electron flow. So uh, using the sensors, uh, I, I have worked on chloroplast and also uh, the relationship between chloroplast and mitochondrion. Our next question is uh, whether uh, we could moderate the chloroplast and mitochondrion activity to promote photosynthesis. And uh, we recently published this work in the uh, QPD. QPD. So here is a video. Uh, our work, our group worked on purple acid properties uh, before uh, 2008. And that uh, my student overexpressed one of these properties in Arbutoxus 
and we accidentally find that uh, they can this transgenic line can grow much faster than the Y type. This is the Y type, and then uh, they can generate, they can mature earlier, and then uh, generate more seed and biomass. And then we had this observation in 2008, and then we published its growth phenotype in 2012 and carry out microarray, small RNA, mitochondria import, coroplast protein import, et cetera, et cetera. And after 12 years, finally, we published its mechanism. Um, in the task growing line, we find that uh, in the 20 days old plants, they have higher sucrose and glucose comparing to the Y type. And then uh, from the 20 days old plants, we collect uh, the leaf uh, at the end of night and we turn on the light for one hour and then turn on the light for eight hours and we collect the plants. And then we extract the plants to measure ATP and ADP. And then we find that the fast growing line at all three time points have higher ATP than the white tape. And however, in the middle of day, the fast growing line have lower NAD peaks than the Y type. And the ratio, NAD peaks, NADP ratio at the middle of day, the fast growing line also have a lower ratio. And at all three time points, the fast growing line have higher ATP to NAD peaks ratio. So it seems that there are excess ATP in the OE line. And elimination increased NADPH in both white type and OE, but uh, <clears throat> the NADPH accumulate in the OE was lower than the white type at the middle of day. So why? So uh, this protein is a purple acid properties, and then in our Arabidopsis genome there are twenty nine purple acid properties, but there are two genes, uh, two of these purple acid properties have an additional C terminus that have a transmembrane motif. And this transmembrane motif have uh, some homology with the TLC3334 and the uh, TOM20. All these are uh, um, receptors of the TOC and TOM, and they stick on the outer membrane of chloroplast and mitochondrion. So ADPAP2 also have this tail. So uh, we show that this tail can bring uh, GFP to both chloroplast and mitochondrion. Uh, sorry, chloroplast and mitochondria. And then we found that it's an anchor on the outer membranes of these two organelles, and the uh, prophetase domain is facing the cytosol. So it's like this. Okay, it's facing the cytosol like the uh, TOC33 and POM20. And then we find that uh, if we remove the N-terminus, the high biomass uh, phenotype disappear. So it's targeting to prostates and mitochondria is essential to the fast growing phenotype. So uh, later we show that it play a role in the PSS2 import into chloroplast and it also play a role in the input of PMOP3 uh, into mitochondria. Okay, so this is the uh, mutant of the uh, uh, PAP2, and the input rate actually uh, is uh, uh, slower. In addition to uh, PSSU, we found that uh, in S2 hybrid and DIFC, uh, PAP2 can selectively uh, interact with some uh, the uh, PS1 acceptor, uh, some proteins at the PS1 acceptor site that include the uh, PSAE1 and E2, um, FD1, FD2, and the uh, FTR. And then um, the fast growing lines also have higher electron transfer rate. And then, but when we look at the two psychic electron flow pathway, they, they, they were indifferent. But if we look at the PS1 oxidation, P700 oxidation, we can see that uh, at low light intensity, uh, the PS1 is more oxidized 
So it seems that uh, the PS1 of the fast growing line can um, release electrons much faster than accepting electrons. Okay, so and this is why it's more oxidized. And that uh, it could be due to a higher PS1 to PS2 ratio. Uh, we carry out a 2D blue native page comparing the uh, photo system of the fast growing line and the uh, white page. And then we can see that in the fast growing line, it contains more rubisco, but it has less PS2. So, uh, and the PS1 is fixed. So, because there's less PS2, so there's higher PS1 to PS2 ratio. Uh, we can see that uh, the thylakoid stack of uh, the two fast growing lines, comparing to the white type and the not outline, they have similar diameter, but the two overexpression line, they have been a thylakoid stack comparing to the white type and the DDNA line. So uh, this also indicates a higher PS1 to PS2 ratio. And in mitochondria, we find that uh, the fast growing line has less ATP synthase, but it has higher ATP content. Uh, then uh, we isolate mitochondria from the fast growing line and then compare to the white type, we find that the fast growing line have higher uh, SDH activity as well as it has higher the internal NDH activity. So both of them, um, okay, uh, can generate more, uh, uh, fit more electrons, okay, to the mitochondrion electron transport chain. And then, uh, then we compare some uh, enzymes of the CPD cycle as well as the TSA cycle. Uh, we isolate chloroplast and mitochondrion from the white type and the fast growing line. And then we find that uh, the fast growing line have higher uh, CPD enzymes, okay, higher CPD enzymes. And then it also have uh, some uh, TSA enzymes also uh, have higher capacity in the OE mitochondrion, except the families. And then some of the enzymes have no change. And then for these two, uh, malate dehydrogenase in chloroplast and mitochondrion, uh, they increase uh, 15 to 26%. So put everything together. Uh, PAP2, when we overexpress it uh, on the outer membrane of chloroplast and mitochondrion, it might increase the uh, selective input of certain proteins that change the physiology of chloroplast and mitochondria. And then in the chloroplast, some of the CDP enzyme increase, the Rubisco increase, so it can fix more CO2. And that uh, at the same time, uh, an enhanced CDP uh, cycle can regenerate NADP as the electron acceptor for the linear electron flow. And at the same time, the OE mitochondrion also can have a higher consumption rate of reducing equivalent so that it can generate extra ADP. And then this can uh, consume more reducing equivalent. And as a result, um, it can allow the coral plus to export more because the pressure from the mitochondrion uh, may be less. So uh, as a result, this could also help regenerate NADP so that it can enhance the uh, LEF with more electron acceptors. And also there is a uh, higher PS1 to PS2 ratio. So uh, then the more robust chloroplast can generate more uh, free C compound and more, more robust mitochondria can generate more ATP that can result in a higher production of sucrose that can drive the production, uh, that can drive the plant growth. So when we look at the OE line, it, uh, it has much higher ATP to NADPX ratio than the white type, and it has much lower NADPX to NADP ratio, okay, uh, than the white type. So, uh, so based on the new targeting fast growing lines, based on our work, uh, we postulate that, that uh, the balancing of red dots is important, okay, in these two organelles are important for plant physiology. 
And then we also have tried to swap the C terminus of the PAP2 with TOM20 and overexpress it in uh, our redoxes. And we find that if it's an only target to mitochondrion, the transgenic line, although they have higher ADP because they have more robust mitochondrion, uh, but they have lower sucrose that cause lower CU and uh, more ROS and uh, early senescence. Um, finally, I would like to uh, thank my collaborators. Uh, my group is not very big and we do not have expertise in uh, many research works. And then I rely on the help of my uh, collaborators. And then uh, I also need to thank my students because uh, they work very hard uh, to, uh, in this uh, study. Thank you very much. I, I know that I speak very fast because I have too many to say <laughs> and I have too many slides. Great, thank you very much. Really wonderful work. Thank you and an excellent, excellent presentation. And I think your work really very nicely demonstrates the power of, of sensor technology coupled with quantitative imaging, which you've, you've nicely talked us through the examples for. So let's have a look if there are any, any questions. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, if I start, so I think this relates to the, the, the first part of your talk. There's a question by Carmen Santana. Did the FRET ATP sensor fail to be shuttled to the mitochondria or the fluorescent proteins to be fully matured in the mitochondria due to the amount of ROS and higher pH? Um, actually, my collaborator, Marcus, he succeeded in January, uh, one line that have the uh, ATP sensors into mitochondria, but uh, the, the, the prime, uh, grow very slowly. So it seems that uh, it affects the um, function of the mitochondria so that the plant uh, does not grow well. So, so, so you will not use this kind of plant for study because you do not know whether what you see is due to the uh, malfunction of the plants or whether it's real. So uh, because mitochondria are very small, and then uh, many of these um, <coughs> sensors, they are pretty big. Uh, for example, for the NADPX sensors, uh, we also failed to introduce them into the mitochondria. Okay, so we, we test, we try, but uh, we could not generate any plants that have the sensor uh, uh, expressing in the mitochondria because this is pretty big. It, it composed of two CPYFD protein. So only the pH sensor uh, in our hands, okay, uh, could be introduced into the mitochondria. And actually it was not done by me, it was done by Marcus. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And I had a question about, I think you said that the, the ATP transporter NTT was downregulated during the night. I was wondering what's known about the mechanism of that regulation, oh, what, what, oh, what the signal not, might be for, for downregulation. Uh, this is not time regulate at night. Is it time regulated when the tissue mature? Ah, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and, but the, 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 so in terms of the regulation, though, do you know what's what's known about the, the signal that down regulates the transporter? Um, because if the transporter mm -hmm. is constitutively expressed, um, the plant will waste a lot of energy at the night because. Um, you can see that the cytosolic ATP in the, at the night, okay, uh, can, if the transporter were there, it would get into the chloroplast. And the chloroplast actually can consume a lot of ATP. So is it not uh, economical for mm -hmm. the uh, plant to constitutively express the NTT transporter when the chloroplast mature? So that's why uh, is it only expressed, okay, when the chloroplast was immature so that the ATP can go inside uh, to build the chloroplast, okay, because of protein import and a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, metabolism required ATP. But once the chloroplast become um, mature, then the NTP uh, have to be done regulated. And so that the chloroplast can, will not consume ATP at night, 
and then during the day, um, during the day, it will just, um, if you look at this, um, during the day, um, ATP cannot go inside, so there will be export. Okay, there will be uh, ATP uh, cannot go inside, so there will be export of this uh, Mali. So this will build up here. Right. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. Yeah. A, I can see a second question from Carmen Santana. I think this relates to the last bit of your talk. The question is: Is the fertilization rate of the faster growing mutant the same as the control one? I think so because uh, we didn't. Um, I, I didn't pay much attention to it, but the the seed um, weight uh, per thousand seed weight are the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it the same? Um, yeah, I think it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, 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 I thought it. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't remember that, but I, I in in my memory, is it the same? But it mm -hmm. just have more seeds and then have a more seed yielded plants. Yeah. Okay. If there are any more questions, can I encourage people to post them in the chat? If there are any more questions for, for Boone? Maybe like I can ask a sort of more futuristic question. And so you've, you've touched on various centers that you've you've developed and, and, and shown how you can use these very effectively to answer these sort of bigger questions about energy flows in this case and, and ATP levels, what would be top of your list of sensors to develop going forward that would that would help push this area even further? Uh, we noticed that um, there is a group in Chile and they have yeah. developed a high rate sensor. Um, they, they test this in the animal cells and mm -hmm. now we are uh, introducing it into uh, Arvidopsis. And then uh, actually the sensors, um, the, the, the line that I have generated, uh, we didn't look at the root and then uh, we have carried out some work on gut cells. And then uh, <clears throat> we are also uh, working on potents. So, um, so we are looking at the, uh, not only on mesophiles, but we can extend the work in the studies of uh, the energy metabolism in other tissues. Yeah, excellent. Okay, um, I'm not I'm not seeing any more questions in the in the chat. So, unless there are any last ones that anyone wants to post, if not, can we all thank thank Boone for a really excellent seminar and and yeah, thank you for sharing all this this really exciting work with us and. Yeah, we look forward to hearing about your next your next discoveries. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.